Sight, hearing, touch, taste and smell are the senses sending information to our brains. Depending on how we interpret and process this information depends on whether we see the world for what it is or not. And we can be easily fooled. So pilots must have means and ways of managing misperceptions and illusions. It's really how we process information. So we take in information from the world through our senses. So a vision, obviously, a hearing, even feel and touch has a big part to play. So how we take in that information is one of the issues that if we don't process that information in enough time, sometimes we can make hasty decisions. So the quality of what the information that comes into the brain is often called sensory perception or taking in you know, the cues from the environment. We've got to process that in our brain somehow and make decisions about it and then we've got to do something. We've got to you know, perform some kind of action. And there's lots and lots of issues that can go wrong. Time pressure, uh, misdiagnosing the information that you bring in from the environment, being distracted. And we actually have what we call a physiological limitation. Our brains can only take in so much at a given time. And people would know that you know, when they do something like reverse parallel park in a car park, they're on the phone to their, to their mum or their, maybe their dad. They're on a, hopefully a hands-free phone, obviously, but you know, what happens is as you start to make sure that you're getting into that car park well, if you've got a truck behind you, there's a gap in the conversation on the phone and your mum or dad might be asking you, what are you doing? Of course, what that illustrates is that our brains can only process really one thing at a given time. They're limited by how much they can process at any one point. So information processing, we have limitations as human beings that really in some cases we, we can't get over. Understanding about those limitations is the first principle. So being knowledgeable about the limitations of vision, particularly at night time, the limitations of hearing in noisy cockpits, the limitations of also understanding phraseology, particularly when talking to air traffic control and other parties. Understanding and, and being knowledgeable about those risks is the first step. The second, I think, then, is really being proactive about those issues. So in an operational environment, understanding that, you know, if you are flying in visual conditions and you're not instrument rated, it's making sure that you don't get caught in that situation where you are then pushing the boundaries and then transitioning from visual um, flight rules to, to IMC. Planning is really one of the key parts of making sure that we understand what we can and can't do and understanding our own limitations. It's about how we process information, how we actually detect information or changes in the system, how we process that mentally and uh, physically as well. So physical characteristics of the limitations of our eyesight or limitations of how much information we can actually manage and recall at the time. And when we're getting clearances in the aviation environment, uh, air traffic control clearances, we need to have a system or a way that we deal with that. Now some people that's writing it down, other people have a way of remembering it. Um, as you're being given that instruction to repeat it back to yourself before you, you know, answer that or read back that clearance and then a way of actually dealing with that clearance. So it's how we actually receive information, process it, make sense of it and then act upon it. There's lots of examples of incorrect readbacks on clearances uh, being cleared to a, a wrong level. There was a famous accident that happened with uh, Flying Tigers, which was a cargo operation or airline many, many years ago. In those days, we used to you'd be given a clearance uh, to descend to a particular level, and they were uh, cleared to 2,400 feet from memory, which was 2400. They read back cleared to 400 and descended to 400 feet. Um, so descending to 400 feet rather than 2400. There just happened to be a hill in front of them that was higher than 400 feet and they ended up crashing into that hill. So from that we changed the way we actually give clearances and read back clearances. Other examples of looking into the way humans process information and human performance, uh, for instance fatigue, things that we mentioned before, you know, the time of day, uh, recognising the effect of circadian rhythms, so that's the, the time of day and how alert you are at different times of the day. You know, how do we manage that? An example would be for a lot of operations, you know, aeroplanes are flying during the day and maintenance is done overnight. So that can be done in you know, very cold or very hot hangars, uh, it's dark, 
you know, trying to read task cards which might be written in you know, pretty light sort of uh, faint fonts, uh, often in the old days and all in capital letters on a task card. So dealing with that in a better way to actually present the information to the engineers in a user-friendly way, you know, dealing with those sort of issues to try and minimise those risks. In medicine, we have problems of sensory overload and machine overload and information overload. And it comes down to, in medicine, we're dealing with those priorities. Like when I go to a medical emergency team call, we have these priorities that we follow that we know work. Look after the airway. You know, are they breathing? Have they got a circulation? We follow that doctor's ABC again and again and again. So with all of the other processes that we follow in the critical care environment, there is a priority for those as well. There is uh, breathing, there is oxygenation, there is circulation, then there's neurological function, then there's nutrition, removal of waste. I mean, all of this stuff, there is a systematic prioritised approach that you can follow. And the same applies, in my experience, of understanding the priorities involved in the decision-making process involved in flight. And, and now I recognise the value of making a lot of that algorithmic. Like I follow those clear off checks when I'm flying, I, I do it. I just cycle through, rotate through, because it makes sense to me as a system that works in my other career. So the human mind is, uh, is a remarkable piece of your body. Uh, even sometimes when you make an error and you don't think you've made an error, you can still think that you're correct. And one of the examples of that I saw uh, in my previous employment as an air traffic controller was the assignment of a level to an aircraft to, you know, to send a flight level 310. And, and the controller will swear black and blue that flight level 310 was the level read back, it's the level he assigned. And it's not until you take the ATC down into the tape replay room and he hears himself or herself reading back flight level 330 and not flight level 310, that it's absolutely a surprise. The lesson for that for me is that you really do have to accept the fact that you make mistakes. We've heard how easy it is to make mistakes and be misunderstood. So listen closely to the following conversation between an impatient pilot and an easygoing engineer. Mate, what's going on? I thought the plane was ready. Ah, uh, she'll be ready when she's ready, mate. What does that mean? I've got passengers here. Hey, it means what it means. You can't rush these things. The safety of you and your passengers should be a priority. Like Mike said, it'll get done. <gasps> it'll get done. I've heard all that before. I've got to be in Dubbo for a funeral. An amateur trapeze artist. I have to perform tonight. So the flight's been delayed and no one's happy. But did you notice all the changes? Believe it or not, there are over 18 changes in this scene. Did you see them all? We have priority. Like Mike said, it'll get done. It'll get done. In the world today, seeing isn't always believing, and things are not often what they seem. Look at these two lines. The one on top appears longer. But remove the arrows, and all is revealed. It depends on your perception. Some see a vase, but others see two talking heads. So it's being aware that we're all susceptible to illusions and developing means and ways to manage them. We do a, quite a bit of flying over water and quite a lot of IFR flying. Pilots need to understand the human factors, the human elements that can cause things like illusions over a glassy ocean. The east coast of Australia don't often see a glassy ocean. You've nearly always got those big southeasties and the big swells, so you nearly always got a horizon when you're over water. A big part of that is understanding your human limit, having a, a process in place to deal with that. Knowing that I don't have a horizon, I'm going to this horizon, my G1000 or my little round dial or whatever it is that I've got, and knowing that I've got a backup and, and cross-referencing it and going to what you're trained to do is your scan, move around your scan, back out and back in, and knowing that now and again you're going to get the leans late at night in the dark when you're tired and been on the clocks for a long time, just knowing that it happens. And when it happens, just, just know that you'll, you'll sit back a bit and you'll just trust your instrumentation and you'll cross-reference and check and you might go out now and again. That comes back to the core of good training. And I'm starting to think I'm not turning. Keep going a bit longer. All right, I don't think I'm turning now. Okay. 
yeah. <laughs> Uh, my, my head is rolling, it, it, my body thinks I'm rolling this way and um, all the senses of, from vision says that I'm sitting still does not match with my vestibular system. It is totally out of whack. Now it's coming back so my eyesight's overpowering this vestibular and now I've got it back. But um, there was a sense of disbelief. If I had not had the visual senses and I'd lifted my head up the way I just did, yep. I would have easily rolled the aircraft inverted to keep what I thought was yep. the normal attitude. But I've been flying for 37 years, 17,000 hours. I had 11 years in the Air Force where we regularly, because of the three-dimensional manoeuvres we were doing in and out of cloud, we were regularly getting ourselves disoriented. So we were used to the conflict of the vestibular system and the instruments, and, and that was common day stuff for us. Um, all the training, all the hours and experience I had didn't help me one iota when it came to sitting in the Barani chair. The sensation of rolling and tumbling in that chair was real and there is no experience, nothing you can do, no course you can do to take away that rolling sensation. You just have to understand it exists, live with it and uh, respond to it, which means you follow the instruments. Visual illusions can affect a pilot at night, particularly the land versus the sky. The reliance is to trust your instruments, to manage a very active scan rate on all your six basic flight instruments, to protect yourself from the leans and other visual illusions that could be part and parcel of that event. It's the understanding of what can occur and how you can become disorientated in certain circumstances. We call it an instrument rating for good reason, because we're training you to trust those instruments and manage or replicate when you can't see a horizon, when you've got no visual cues, that you can gain the same information from the adaptation of your eyesight to the instrument panel. On a very dark night, a very dim lit cockpit, and the, the perception of rate of movement, of acceleration, is difficult to pick up because you can't see the side cues from the eyes and see the, the speed at which the aircraft's accelerating to. And so your only reference to speed is what you see on the airspeed indicator. When you reach your target liftoff speed, it's then transitioning from what you see as runway lights ahead. And as the nose pitches up, of course, the runway lights disappear. And all you're left with is the power setting, the attitude, wings level, trimming the aircraft and flying a profile that clears the obstacles in the flight path. If you don't get on instruments as you transition into liftoff, you can very quickly become inverted and descend and hit the ground. Do not take your eyes off those instruments. Trust them. You must trust them, otherwise it'll kill you.